greetings to you all dear students hope you are all doing very well so we are commencing our second semester classes from february 12th and i am again taking up a maths paper for you titled statistics for engineers with the code jma2201 this paper is offered under regulation 23 for you all and as again we shall be taking a minimum of 60 periods to complete them as you did matrices and calculus in semester 1 you will find that this paper is extremely useful and another very big toolbox for especially computer science students so i suggest that you take all the five units very seriously not just for the exam point of view but also for the application usage in the semesters to come so basic statistics and a little more than that is what we are going to emphasize in these five units as you can see here we have random variables in the first one the second unit is standard distributions and if you have see this the third one is statistical correlation and regression which is a pure set of problems like similar to how you did in class 11 and 12 the fourth one is testing of hypothesis which is another main important tool for any engineer and finally we have design of experiments where you will see how to design a particular experiment and how to solve it so the, each unit is comprising of a maximum of four topics and where so that you could understand the concepts and apply them in the semesters to come in your projects etc so a vibrant kind of a paper it is the order in which we shall be following this particular paper would be units 3 first then we shall go to the fifth unit then do the fourth and then do 1 and 2 so the order in which we shall be doing would be unit 3 is the first one this is the first one then unit 5 design of experiments is the second unit then unit 4 is the testing of hypothesis then unit 1 random variables then unit 2 standard distributions so this is how we are going to take it forward so i shall now begin by first of all telling you what is statistics and where is where is statistics used in our real life then we shall understand why statistics is so important for engineers after we briefly introduce or get introduced to this kind of the topics we shall then start with unit 3 which is the statistical correlation and regression so this is how we are going to go about it so let's begin with our basic definitions dear students the word statistics is not new to you i am sure you would recall that you have done problems when you were given the data to find out the measures of dispersion namely mean median mode pertaining to a given data so statistics basically is a mathematical science that deals with collection presentation analysis interpretation and mainly the use of data and what do we do by using such a data is to make concrete decisions today we are in that crux of situation where we have huge data and we do not know what to do with them so statistics is playing a very vital role in data science specially to make decisions solve complex problems design products like we are going to do in unit 5 what we call as design of experiments so we are going to design products and various processes so statistics is used at every stage starting from designing making a finished product and also making it work so you will see as an engineer when you go into your workplace you will see the value of statistics at every stage of this process so in simple terms we can define statistics to be simply the science of data so we are as we are in today's world dealing with loads of data 
now how to utilize how to use this data interpret results and then proceed further is the main order of the day which statistics completely helps us in where is statistics used now i don't think i should be telling you specific, specifically where it is used because you may say it is used in because we are dealing with data in data analytics in uh, data science and basically to find out the averages that we want no dear students wherever you can think of a domain around you statistics plays a role if you can look at some of the ones which i have mentioned here in this slide astronomy biology economics genetics marketing medicine psychology public health sports your engineering think of a domain that is around you and please and understand that without statistics nothing can be done so where do we basically give us some examples where statistics is used is suppose i want to know which fertilizer produces the highest yield or out of the two drugs that i have in treating a particular disease which is more effective and if i want to judge if a particular habit in school which students are up to say smoking is it more in in affluent or rich children's or is it a, a habit which is cultivated among all the students if i want to judge if i want to make an inference relating to some of these i have to use a statistical tool to solve it it is not just in the air that i can decide no this is the result or this is the result we have statistical techniques or tools which will help us to solve or recognize and infer results based on the real time situations dear students the name of the course that we are doing this year semester is statistics for engineers now we may ask having understood what is statistics where is it used we why for engineers the question may arise you being computer science students can never say why statistics because you are supposed to know that in every domain that you can think of in computer science statistics plays a role i have stated a few of them in this particular slide the first one being data analytics or analysis where it is statistics is being used to identify meaningful insights or extract these insights and patterns from large data sets and this is what is the order of the day data analysis plays a very vital role because huge data sets sets are available and lot of interpretation is being done using statistical tools and lot of meaningful decisions are being made and that is one of the major applications of statistics it's also used for machine learning and artificial intelligence for image recognition and nlp in quality control to ensure quality and reliability of computer systems and software in network analysis to study the communication patterns traffic flow and performance optimization in predictive analytics to make predictions and forecasts using the older data that is available to us so this is a very few topics that i have put mention in this slide but the applications as you will go through it during the coming semesters also you will see the application of statistics at length in and you will truly appreciate its its usage in computer science so we are here we have introduced this course not just like that but knowing the real applications of statistics especially for a computer science student so i seriously feel that you all must take this paper more seriously not only for the exam point of view but by knowledge wise so that you could apply them tomorrow in the research papers that you would be doing in the semesters to come so dear students with this background let us begin with our syllabus now as i said we start with unit 3 the title of unit 3 is statistical correlation and regression and to know the syllabus of this unit we learn the concepts of correlation coefficient 
rank correlation, correlation for bivariate data, regression coefficients, and lines of regression. This would be the syllabus that we should be had taking up now. So we start with what is correlation and then types of correlation. Then we shall study the first topic, which is correlation coefficient. Now, the first question that we have here that you can see in the slide is what is correlation? So the method of studying the relationship between two variables. So it means that if you are given two variables with a set of data assigned in it, based on the data, I would like to know whether there is a relationship between the two variables. So if I see that there is a relationship, then I would say that there is a correlation between X and Y. If there is no relationship, then I will conclude that the two variables are uncorrelated. So what is the way to know that these two variables are correlated or not? So that's my second question. When do we say that two variables are correlated? So how do I know that the two variables are correlated? For that, I should see that if there is a change, suppose I change the value of x at a particular time or whatever the parameter is. And if you find that there is a corresponding change, there is also a change in y. That means the value of y is getting influenced by the value of x. So a change in one variable, it causes a change in the other variable. Then I will conclude that there is some kind of a correlation between x and y. So as I write, as I've written here, let's see. If a change in the value of one variable, it could be x or y, it produces a change. So it's automatically generating a change in the value in the other variable, which is y or x. Then we say that the two var variables are correlated or there is a correlation between the two variables is what we conclude. So let us recall, what do we mean by correlation? It's a method of studying the relation, if there is a relationship between two variables. How do we judge whether the, there is a relationship or not? Is by changing the value of one variable and we see that there is a change in the other variable happening. So a change in one variable is producing a change in the other variable. Then I will conclude that the two variables are correlated. How are they correlated? There we come to the types of correlation. So there are three types of correlation. One is positive correlation, as you can guess. The second is negative correlation. And the third is no correlation. That means there is no correlation between the two variables. Now, you can recognize definition of positive correlation directly. I told you, whenever there is a change in the other variable because of the change in the first variable, we conclude that the variables are correlated. Now, suppose the two variables change in the same direction. Now, that's important here. So, suppose the variables change in the same direction, meaning what? If an increase in the value of x causes an increase in the value of y or a decrease in the value of x causes a decrease in the value of y, then I will say that the correlation is positive or the variables are positively correlated. So that's what I have written here, that if an increase or a decrease in the value of one variable produces or yields an increase or decrease in the value of the other variable, then the variables are said to be positively correlated. There are number of variables that are around you where you can judge if they are positively correlated or not. Dear students, try to frame examples, though I have given you a few of them here. Examples of some positively correlated variables are savings and financial security. That is, if your savings increase today, then naturally you are going to have that financial security. 
so in future you are safe if you have the savings but if you don't have savings naturally your financial security becomes very weak so if there is an increase here there's an increase here if there's a decrease here there's a decrease here similarly exercise and strength so if you exercise your muscles you are bound to be fit and strong if not naturally there is going to be a slack height and weight of a group of people they are positively correlated to income and expenditure if your income increases the expenditure also normally increases is the order of the day isn't it so income and expenditure is also positively correlated variables in a similar lines let us see in our next slide as to what is negative correlation and what do we mean by no correlation similar to what we saw in the previous slide let us now look at the other two types of correlation namely negative correlation and no correlation so in positive correlation we saw that an increase in one variable causes an increase in the other variable and similarly if a decrease in one variable causes a decrease in the other variable we conclude the two variables are positively correlated so obviously when we talk about negative correlation the increase in one will cause a decrease in the other and a decrease in one may cause an increase in the other for which we conclude that the variables are negatively correlated that means the two variables change in opposite directions some of the examples that i have stated here are price and demand of a commodity if the price increases naturally the demand decreases and if the price decreases the demand increases similarly exercise and body weight if we exercise then the body weight decreases and if we don't exercise the body weight increases similarly the volume and pressure of a perfect gas tax and dividend of a company they are all negatively correlated variables coming to the third type of correlation which we define as no correlation it means that a change in the value of one variable does not cause any change with the value of another variable so that means the two variables have no connection at all for an example which you can think of many as you can think one of them which i have given here weight of a person and the color of the hair of a person so they are totally unrelated even when we as we speak we recognize so you don't have to really say that these two are uncorrelated so if the value of one variable has no effect on the value of the other variable then you say that the two vari variables are uncorrelated so these are the three types of correlation now let us look at what is correlation coefficient now let's start with the first definition of the unit called correlation coefficient Carl Pearson who was a british biometrician he developed a formula called correlation coefficient and this formula was given his name and thus is read as carl pearson's coefficient of correlation or simply correlation coefficient which is represented by the greek letter rho so we have various formula for different cases to find out this correlation coefficient the first one which is a direct method so we are given x values we are given y values so this is something like how you did in school we are going to do a statistical work by constructing a table and uh, directly finding out the totals of certain columns using them in the formula given to you this is the formula but to understand the formula let's see how to proceed further so x and y values are given to us about n number of them are given so n is the number of data the number of data that we are given for each x and y naturally it should be the same number for both x and y so if you look at the formula what all does it have this sigma 
i am sure all of you recognize the notation of the meaning of sigma this notation means summation that means addition of all elements so what we do sigma xy sigma x sigma y sigma x square and sigma y square we are given so how do we use this data in order to find the correlation coefficient is i construct some more columns like i square x then i square the values of y and i multiply the two values x and y so when i have say 10 here i am squaring it to get me 100 here if i have the value here as 5 then that means i am going to write 25 here and if i want to find x y I am multiplying x and y, that is 5 into 10, 50. So, thereby, I complete this process for all the n values given to me and I calculate the totals. Now, this column total is going to give me the summation of all the x square values. So, this will give me sigma x square. This will give me sigma y square. I am sorry, I am using capital letters here. And this will give me sigma capital xy. Now, you see, my n value is known, sigma xy is this value, sigma x is this value, with where I can add up all the x values, I add up all the y values, this will give me sigma y, I am sure you are recalling your uh, 11th and 12th standard uh, problems that you did in statistics to earn your full marks, so sigma x is given, sigma y is given, sigma x square is given, now what does this mean is, it is sigma x the whole square. That means the sigma x value, whatever you get here, you are squaring it. And note that the whole term is within the root. There are two terms in the denominator. This is one and this is one with respect to x and y. And so I substitute them and get the value of rho. So this is a direct method. X value is given, y value is given. I construct three more columns. I calculate x square, y square, x, y, calculate the totals of all of them and then I substitute them in the formula to get the value of correlation coefficient. So, this is a direct method but this has a disadvantage. Now, what type of disadvantage it has is the values of x and y that I give you here, these are quite big numbers, huge numbers. So, when they are huge numbers, we cannot be squaring them. Though we are using calculators here, though we are using calculators, still any huge data could be tough to handle, maybe even could make silly mistakes and therefore there are certain simplified versions to find out the correlation coefficient if you do not want to use the direct method. But as I specified, there is no, not, no, no, no method that is going to be specified in the question. So, I leave it to your good uh, sense or your way of working out in order to simplify the problem and do it. Or if you are free in doing it or using your calculators, you can even proceed it directly. The second method that I have is called the actual mean method. Meaning, what I do, I am given capital X, I am given capital Y. Now, what I do here is calculate what is X bar and Y bar. X bar and Y bar denote the mean of X and the mean of Y. I am sure you all know how to calculate the mean of X. I add all the elements of X, all the data points of X and divide it by the number total number of values given to me. That's how you calculated mean in your school. And we denote it by the notation x bar. The bar denotes the mean. So, I first calculate x bar. I calculate y bar by calculating sigma x, sigma y and dividing it by the total number of data given to me. And then I do some more steps. So, by doing this, what am I doing is I am reducing the complexity of the data points. Suppose I am given something like 2546 here. Then imagine if I have to calculate x square. Now, though we are using calculators, still the method, we should know how to simplify a given particular problem. So, what are we going to do? We are going to define small x where 
we calculate the deviations from x bar that means the suppose the x bar value is 2500 okay now 2546 minus 2500 will be 46 so i am going to make use of this small x instead of capital x hereafter so i am considering the differences between x and x bar and i calculate all of them similarly y as capital y minus capital y bar calculate all of them now this small x and small y are smaller are lesser in value than capital x and capital y so I am going to now, what all do I require? You see here, sigma xy I require, x square and y square. So I will now construct three more columns, x square, y square, xy. And these will give me sigma x square. This will give me sigma y square. This will give me sigma xy. And I shall use it in this formula, which I have given it to you in the more simplified form and get the value of rho. Whether you use the direct method without finding the deviations from mean or you use the actual mean method and calculate the value of rho, both the answers would be the same. Kindly note, but only the simplifications will be easier because if you are given huge values, this will simplify the values. That's the only way that this is better than the direct method. But again, as I say, if you feel direct method is easier and you can use calculators without making mistakes, never mind, please continue. The third method that is even more easier is the assumed mean method. Now, in the previous case, x values were given, y values were given. So, suppose I am given, say, 50 or 503, 407, 122 and say minus 79 and again 727 and so on and here i am given something like 75 23 45 11 7 etc so what did i do in my previous uh, assumed as you actual mean method i calculated x bar i calculated y bar meaning i found the actual mean and then i took the deviation but in this assumed mean, I am not going to calculate the actual mean, but I am going to assume one of the values of x and one of the values of y as the mean. So what I do is I assume, say here, 122 as the mean. So I call it A. This is an assumption I am making. It is not the actual mean. My, you may ask me, why take 122? Why not take 407? Why not take 727? You can take any number given in the table on the X. I have taken 122. You may take here 11 as B. And this is your assumed mean now. So assumed mean of X is 122. Assumed mean of Y is 11. That could be anything. Anything, any value given there in the table. Then what I do is proceed as I did in the actual mean. I am calling it as dx and dy just to show the distinction between method 2 and method 3. So now my dx is equal to dx small x that I am writing here. d small x is equal to capital X minus 122. Then I am writing dy as equal to capital Y minus say 11. So I am going to calculate 503 minus 122, 407 minus 122. This is 0. This is 79 minus 122, 727 minus 122. Here 75 minus 11 and so on. I get all the values by taking the difference. Now I usually, like how I have given formula number 1, direct method. What all do I require? I require sigma dx dy dx square so what are the columns extra i will make dx square dy square dx dy so i am going to calculate the total of dx calculate the total of dy calculate the total of dx square dy square dx dy and use it in this formula and i get the same value of rho as i if i had done using the direct method or the assumed mean 
method, actual mean method. So since I have assumed the mean here, this method is called, called as assumed mean method. So we will see how to do this and in problems a little later. In this slide, I have shown you the first type, which is the direct method. And what are the various columns that we will have to be framing? So this X is given to us, Y is given to us. And what we have to frame is X square, Y square, XY. Directly find out the columns, uh, the column totals of all of them, and then substitute it in the standard formula. And uh, as we all remember, Sigma X, the whole square is the squaring of Sigma X. Sigma X square is the total of column three. Similarly, the remaining terms and get the value of correlation coefficient. Here we are explaining the actual mean method where the deviations of X from X bar and Y bar are taken, where X bar denotes Sigma X divided by N, Sigma Y divided by N is Y bar. So we are going to first calculate the means and then from this is X is given to us, Y is given to us, the remaining columns are created. So small x is what we have assumed as x minus x bar. Y, small y is capital Y minus Y bar. We are taking the deviations of x, 48. Assuming that the mean here that we have found is 25.2. I've just taken it for an example. And Y bar, if it is 17.5, we are taking the deviations from the values of Y. And then we are taking x square, y square, x, y, the totals, and then thereby using it in the standard formula that was explained to you in the previous slide. So this gives us the correlation coefficient using the actual mean method. The third method, which is the assumed mean method, we are assuming a mean of x and a mean of y, where it is called as a and b. And we denote the deviations as dx and dy only for our convenience sake. Thereby, x and y are given to us. We frame dx, dy, dx square, that is a square of the value of x. Then similarly, dy square, dx, dy. Calculate the totals and apply it in the formula given to us. There is one more small, even a better practice which can be done here in this case where if we find the values of X are equally spaced, suppose I have 48, then I have 58, then I have 68, 78, etc. We see that the values of X are successively placed with the gap of 10 units each. In the same manner, if I have 20, 25, 30, 35 along Y, then here, the common space that I have is 5, and I'm calling it as k. When we have that x and y are equally spaced, which is not so in every problem, then the definition of dx can be redone by dividing that scaling factor. The common, the common value that separates the values of x can be divided and so dx can be written as x minus a by h. So this column can be changed as dx is equal to x minus a by h. And dy can be written as y minus b by k. So that all the values will be considerably decreased. And the procedure can be followed in a similar manner. And the same formula can be used to find the value of rho. So as per the note given in the previous slide. I have here represented dx as x minus a by h by using the scaling factor as h and dy as y minus b by k. I repeat the h is the value of the, the differences, the common difference between successive values of x and the common difference between successive values of y is k. If the data is so where we have a common value, then it, the values or the deviations can be divided by the scaling factor and the formula can be used in a similar manner because correlation coefficient is completely independent of change of origin. Here it is A and B 
and the scale here which is h and k so irrespective of what we choose for a and b or h and k the correlation coefficient value will not change so it can be more simpler it can be made simpler by dividing by h and k so that the values will completely reduce and its complexity and further computation can be done easily so these are the three methods which have been explained uh, in an elaborate fashion before we take up problems in a, in, a, in the next class now that we have learned the various formulae given by Carl Pearson to find out the correlation coefficient between two variables, it is very important to recognize what could be the value of R or what is the range in between which the values of R can lie. And the correlation coefficient that can lie is between minus 1 and plus 1, inclusive of being minus 1 or plus 1. If rho is positive, it means that the values of x and y either increase together or decrease together, meaning rho, it is the variables are positively correlated. If rho is exactly plus 1, then that means there is a perfect positive correlation between the variables x and y. And as we can guess that if rho is negative, that means the variables are negatively correlated it means that if one increases, the other decreases, that is the variables move in opposite directions. And if rho is exactly equal to minus 1, it means that there is perfect negative correlation between the two variables. And because 0 lies between minus 1 and plus 1, when rho takes the value 0, it seriously strictly means that the two variables are uncorrelated. So the most important point to recognize here is the value of rho lies between minus 1 and plus 1. And if it is plus 1, it is perfectly positive correlated. And if it is minus 1, it is perfectly negative correlated. And if it is 0, then it means it is uncorrelated. So, and the values of rho can be anywhere between these this range. So, whenever we use in the formula that we have just learned, we must remember that the row value must lie between minus 1 and plus 1. So, dear students, now that you have learned the theory of how to find the correlation coefficient and also recognize what must be the value of rho or what is the range in which the value of rho must lie, we must now go ahead starting with the problems that we will be doing one after the other. So please take up the work, keep your calculators ready and get ready for the first problem.